in the next step of photosynthesis, we will see how atmospheric carbon dioxide is converted into a precursor to a sugar molecule. The ATP and NADPH from the light reactions will power what is called the carbon reactions. Carbon dioxide from the atmosphere via a process known as carbon fixation will be converted into a carbon molecule that the, that the plant can use to make sugar. This carbon molecule is called a P-gal and it has three carbons. Because this P-gal has, three, has three carbons, we will follow what happens to three carbon dioxides. If we, if we look at these three carbon dioxides and we count up the carbons, we end up having three carbons in total. This is taking place in the part of the chloroplast known as the stroma. Within the stroma, there are molecules that have five carbons on them. And these molecules are called RUBPs. Since we are following three carbon dioxides, we will use three RUBPs in order to fixate the three carbon dioxides. Let's first count the number of carbons we have when we start. We have five carbons on each ruby P for a total of 15 carbons. We have one carbon on each carbon dioxide for a total of three carbons. So when this fixation happens, we should have a total of 18 carbons. The enzyme that does carbon fixation is known as the Rubisco enzyme. It takes the carbon from carbon dioxide and attaches it to RUBP. So the step that brings us to the fixation of carbon gives us an unstable intermediate that has six carbons on it, five from the ruby P and one from the carbon dioxide. We are following three of these molecules. And if we count up our carbons at the end of the step, we end up having 18 carbons. Because this is an unstable intermediate, it will split in half and give us six three carbon molecules known as PGA. If we count up the number of carbons we have at this point, we have six three carbon molecules for a total of still 18 carbons. That means we have not lost any carbons yet. The next step uses the energy from the light reactions in the molecules known as ATP and NADPH to convert the six PGAs into six P-gals. Again, if we count up the number of carbons, we have six P-gals, each with three carbons on it. We still have 18 carbon molecules. However, at this point in the carbon reaction, one of these P-gals exits the loop, and we have to account for it right here. Once this P-gal has exited the loop, we now are left with five P-gals. 
if we count up our carbons at this point, we now have 15 carbons. The next step reshuffles these five P gals into the molecule we started with, which was RuBP. And this is precisely why we have 15 carbons at the beginning of the carbon reactions. It is because this process can continue as a cycle and regenerate its starting material. At this point, we need to follow what happens to that one p-gal that exits the carbon reactions. Now realize it has three carbons. To make glucose, we need six carbons. So these three carbons will not be enough to make a glucose molecule. That means that we need to do two cycles of carbon reactions in order to get the six carbons to make glucose. And that's exactly what happens. After two rounds of carbon reactions, we have two p-gals, each with three carbons. The plant then assembles sugar from these two p-gals to make a glucose molecule which has six carbons. The plant can take this sugar and polymerize it to make starch, which is stored energy for the plant, or the energy within the sugar molecule can be converted with the help of the mitochondria of the plant cell to make large amounts of ATP.